I shared this definition last hour and what we consider to be the definition of development and it's rational relationships, right? And we had some conversation about what does rational mean? And what exactly does that mean? We're gonna spend a little more time this hour talking about what these concepts are. So let's talk about relationships because I made this case earlier that development, fundraising, advancement, philanthropy is about relationships, not about dollars, not about transactions, not about arrangements. But I think it's pretty safe to say that many of our relationships personally, and certainly many of the relationships that people kind of enter our organization with, can be emotional. Someone received Jesus as their savior because of an event that we put on. Someone broke an addiction because of a service that we provide. A young woman goes to a pregnancy care center and has some counseling that changes her mind about how to handle that life. Someone goes to a camp and has a healing experience in terms of the relationship with their family or with friends. So many people come to organizations and our ministries through an emotional situation. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But in terms of people and their connection to us in our organization, at some point, that emotional relationship has to turn into a rational relationship, a meaningful relationship, an encouraging relationship, a forgiving relationship, an authentic relationship, an intentional relationship. All those words that we use to describe with our friends and peers. I, I have a, a great story. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the United States with uh, Christian pregnancy care centers. And one of the big events that most of those groups do is a big banquet every year. And they have two, three, 400 people come into a room and there are tables of eight or 10. They've got a table host uh, a husband and a wife who's invited these individuals and people know that they're there and people know that you're going to be asked for a contribution. So it's pretty clear up front. But there's always these incredible stories of life change. Young men who decided to go back and support a, a baby that they fathered that they had kind of abandoned. A young woman who made a decision for life instead of the other direction. Uh, a generation of families who struggled with issues and had the support and the care and the love from a pregnancy care center. And they're all emotional. And everybody in the room can feel it, right? And then I'm at the table and the phone rings. And the babysitter says, hey, your kid fell down the stairs, there's a lot of blood. I don't care what you've been telling me all night. I have no interest in all those stories of life change because something emotional has happened in my life and I'm in the car and I'm headed home. So that emotion changes, that emotion passes, that emotion fades. So we're either gonna have a whole lot of emotional donors and we have to crank up that level of emotion every time we get together with them, or we build a rational relationship that makes a lot of sense no matter what the emotions are behind a situation or a scenario or an event. So let's talk about that just a, a little bit. Encouraging, supportive relationships have depth, they have significance, they have some sort of reciprocal nature about them, right? So our fundraising efforts need to mirror that, to honor the relationship. There's a commitment there. Even if I don't feel like going to church, I still tithe out of obedience. Even if I don't, you know, like the individual speaker who's at this event I'm at, I'm there because I support the organization. So it doesn't matter how I feel, because God's working in me to be obedient to certain things, I'm still there because I have this rational relationship with a person or with an individual. So at some point, we have to figure out in our, in our fundraising, our development, is there a way to have this relationship kind of turn from emotionalism to rationalism. I think some good examples of rational relationships. Being in love. You know, I can think about, give you all sorts of examples of my relationship with my wife that are very emotional and they're very rational. 
sometimes at the same time. <laughs> Deep friendships. I have four or five men that have been part of my life for the last 20 years, and I would go to the mat for them. And they have done the same for me over time. Authentic, real, relevant, transparent, a lot of forgiveness, a lot of grace, a lot of accountability. Siblings, I had one, she and I aren't that close, so it's not a good example for me, but might be for other people in the room. So let's look at just maybe uh, one. I'm going to talk about being in love with my wife. Now I have to admit, this example usually works. Until I got to an African country where there's still a lot of arranged marriages. And they're looking at me like, love? What do you mean being in love, falling in love? That doesn't happen in our culture. And so I kind of shifted gears after that. But think about just the, the process of being in love. There's my wife. Her name's Elaine. It'll be 40 years this September. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. If she, if she lets me back in the house when I get home, we'll see. And then there am I. This was a long time ago. I won't say. At one point we met, right? That first initial whatever happened to be at a kind of a youth, a youth group gathering. I happened to be leading. She was a little bit younger and she was in the audience. And her best friend at that time, her friend at the time, um, kind of liked me a little bit in that kind of way that high school, you know, secondary school kind of works. And, and Elaine kind of leaned over and said, well, who, who is this guy, and why is everybody kind of, you know, fawning over him? Because I was leading the group, not a big deal. And she goes, oh, that's Greg Long. <laughs> this, is, this is not my wife, this is the other girl. Long story, don't worry about it. But at some point, we met. And then we started to hang out together. And then we started spending a little more time together. And I got to see some characters and qual you know, qualities that, that I really liked. And maybe she saw the same in me. And we kind of started to go out a little bit. And again. And then something happened. But we kept getting together until we got married. And that relationship continues. I know some friends at church who that relationship ended. Divorce or whatever, lots of, lots of stories. So let's talk about what happens in the brackets. This thing that happened in my relationship with Lane, maybe happened with you and your spouse as well. So we're going out together, first maybe in groups and then kind of just the two of us. We're having conversations over dinner. I go to her home, I meet her parents and having coffee or whatever. And I'm talking about my life and my goals, and she's talking about her life and her goals. And I was gonna kind of wasn't really into college at that point, so I kind of skipped college and do some some other stuff and be self-employed. And she was hoping to go to a Bible college and kind of had that thing going on. And then at some point, the I and the me conversations turned to us and to we and the relationship changed. It went from not what I'm gonna do with my future or what she's gonna do with her future, it was the proverbial what if question. What if we got really serious? What if we became committed to each other? What if we, you know, and she, and she knows where I'm going with the conversation, that she's making me say it. <laughs> what if we got m m m married? So. The pronouns change. And I've been in situations with donors and potential donors where I have felt this happen. We're having a conversation and I'm talking about the ministry and then all of a sudden they say, oh, well, we can help you with that. Or we want to join you in what you're doing. And the I and the me become us and we. And it goes from an emotional relationship or perhaps just a, a transparent or superficial relationship to a rational relationship. One with meaning, one with depth, one with commitment. So at some point in our relationships with our potential donors and our donors, we want to kind of see this happen. 
And I've, I've sensed it happen. I've seen it happen in meetings. I've walked down and said, wow, they just became our biggest fan, as you talked about some of your partners in the United States. They want to engage with us in lots of different ways and help us achieve the mission that God's called us all to do. So it's, it's kind of a simple example and maybe a little overdone the way that I do it. But I think we can, we can talk about people in our donor base and people we have relationships with and know, are these people kind of along for the ride? Are these people here because kind of everybody else is here? Or are they here because they're committed? And my guess is you can probably sense that if you think about people, your, your constituents, your beneficiaries, the stakeholders in your organization, you can probably sense some of that. So you want to kind of sense when these pronouns change. And I think in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I think you know it. Even in a small group, I think you know it. You might always sense it, you might always feel it. But I think many times there's a way to kind of help people get from that, you know, oh gosh, we're kind of excited what you're doing to, oh, we are like so excited, we're in. We're jumping in with both feet. We're gonna help you out. How can we be of assistance? And they're on that, on that positive end of the attitude continuum at that point, right? But that takes time. It doesn't happen once. For me and Elaine, it happened over a couple of years. A couple of three years. I should know the front end of that story, I don't. Um, but I asked her to marry me. Um, and she has her side of the story, and you'll just have to ask her for her side of the story because I'm not telling her side. But a rational relationship deepens the substance. Now guess what? I am just as emotional about Elaine as I was 40 years ago. The emotion gets deeper, the emotion gets richer but the rationality gets just as deep. By the time you have kids, and the time you go through career changes, and you have to move, and, and deaths of parents and whatnot. So both those increase, both those get stronger. But you're in this rational relationship, it's not just emotion. Boy, if Elaine decided to lock me out of the house every time I went on a trip, or every time I did something that was unkind or unfair or selfish, I would've been gone a long time ago. God bless a woman who has forgiveness and grace in her life, for me. <laughs> but we think about kind of that, that first time we got together, and I'll kind of now talk about development and fundraising a little bit. We talk about that being kind of the, the exposure event, or the first time that someone's connected to your ministry. It might be at an event. It might be through an individual meeting. It might be through a friend of yours who connects you. Whatever that kind of first exposure is. And we call those, in our line of work, exposure events. Is how do people get to know you for the first time? At these pregnancy care center banquets, that's the time when a lot of people first learn about a care center and what they do and the life change that they bring. If you're at a Christian school, that might be something where someone invites you to a tour of the facility. You know, mom and dad and the kids or whoever's involved in that process to come tour the school and see if they want to become students there. Might be the first time someone invites you to your local church. That's an exposure opportunity for that particular church. Now, churches don't do fundraising the way that we talk about it. They could, but just most of them don't. But what we want to do is, if they had that first exposure with us, we want to make sure we have a second date with them, right? We want to continue that relationship. Otherwise, they say, I don't like you that well, Greg. I'm not, I'm not having, going out with you again. We want to have a way to kind of build that relationship so we have a second exposure event and a third, and a fourth, and make it kind of easy for them to enter a relationship with us. Even if it's emotional at that point, it's okay. But have a way from the kind of ease into a relationship with us. So for us, what times that mean, what that might mean, here's some examples. These aren't hard and fast. Uh, they come to a big banquet or a gala of some kind that an organization puts on, and they fill out a response card that they give us their name and address and phone number, that sort of thing, and they have some check boxes. You know, add me to your mailing list. Uh, I'd like to join your prayer team. Uh, yes, I'm going to give a small contribution right now. Uh, please contact me. I want to hear more about your organization. And you're going to have three or four of those. Don't have 10. That's too many, but three or four. I want to have some that are very, very easy. You know, how, how hard is it to check the box? I want to be one of your prayer partners. Pretty simple, pretty low bar. And you want a low bar because otherwise the standard response is, hey, would you help us with? No. Would you mind giving any? No. Would you ever want to? No. The standard response for most people is no, when asked. So you want to have some things that people can say yes to and make them very, very easy to continue that next exposure and the next exposure and the next exposure. So you're building kind of a path for them to go from this 
first exposure, perhaps an emotional event that they hear about or something that's going on in their life or in the life of someone that's close to them, and building a path for them to been, begin, begin a, a, rational, a rational relationship. So that's kind of what we're, we're thinking about trying to, to, to build here, if that makes sense. But, but again, if we're, if we're building this event or building this festival evangelism or building this camp in a way that brings people to us, then how do we then maintain the relationship after that? It's a simple question. And there is no single right answer. Um, you will have to figure out with your team based on the event, based on how these people enter your stream, if I can use that term, what's the best way to kind of make sure that we stay in, in relationship with them beyond that. And that relationship may or may not turn into dollars. That relationship may or may not turn into to a volunteer. They may have a short visit with you over a few weeks and then decide that this is an organization they can support, they wanna support something else. Or you may decide this is not someone that can be part of our team for lots of different reasons. I've got a client right now who, um, they, the, a couple that was not able to have any kids of their own. And they turned that into ministry for foster kids. And they have fostered 72 children over the last number of years, had them in their home. All these kids taken out of normally traumatic and dramatic situations. They adopted nine of them. Um, and she had this vision put in her heart by God years ago to find a way to help care for young women who, at least in my state, in Ohio, in the United States, when they turn 18, they literally are are taken from the foster home that they were placed in and kind of put on the street. Many of these young women have the same garbage bag of possessions that they had years ago when they were taken from their home and what usually was a traumatic, negative, dramatic situation. She said they need skills, they need encouragement, they need restoration, they need healing. And about three years ago, four years ago maybe, she came to us and said, I hear you guys can help with, with building this dream that I have. And we said, well, explain, explain the dream. What's the vision? I want to have a residential center where young women who, when they age out of the, of the foster system at 18, have a place to come learn skills and learn all the stuff they didn't learn in a traditional family. And she works with a number of young women who've been trafficked. Some of them trafficked within the very foster home that's supposed to be taking care of them. And she has stories that I can just not listen to because I just go in this crazy depressed mode. And my wife, Elaine, said, don't tell me any more stories. I can't handle the stories you tell. God has given you a special heart to work with this population of young women. We don't have it. We'll help you build the organization. Well, and it's not just because God showed up, frankly. We happen to be along for the ride. But they now have a facility. Uh, they had someone fund the facility for them. And they now have four young women who have stayed with them, including along with a, with a young baby, uh, learning about healing through art, learning about job skills. Many of them have a part-time job provided by donors who run restaurants or run offices. It's become an incredible realization of the vision that God put in her. And they have a big banquet, and that's fine. We've told them our story about banquets. But it really is something that I could never, ever do. I can help them build the organization. I'm pretty good at that. That's how God wired me. But I couldn't do the type of counseling and, and, and intervention they do. So one of their first exposures is they have people come to the facility. They come to the house. And they make sure, you know, the young women are being protected and there's a whole separate wing for the young women. But when they have these open houses, people come in and see the facility and see the programming that goes on. And it is just mind-blowing and life-changing when you realize where these women have come from and the kind of skills and opportunities and restoration and healing that they're experiencing. It really is cool. But that is their first exposure for a lot of people. And then they have a whole system built into follow-up and, and connections and offering for them, for folks to come volunteer. They have kind of a whole path laid out. So their system is very different than some of the ones we've talked about. But there needs to be a path. So what's that path that you can build for that first date, that second date, that third date, until they have a relational, a rational relationship with your organization? That's, that's my only point. And it will be different for every single person in the room because your ministers are unique. Your culture is unique. Your country is unique. So don't necessarily look at the person next door in your table who's doing one thing and think, oh, I have to do it that way. And I'm here to help the next three or four days have questions about that specifically. And we'll, we'll learn some of those in the subsequent sessions as well. What are other ways to build that path so people can kind of join us in this rational, meaningful relationship?
but it starts with a first encounter, starts with the first date. And then how do we continue that process?